Good to see each and every one of you out tonight. Pray the Lord has blessed you and been good to you. I don't have to pray that. I know God has blessed you. And God has been good to you. We've had a beautiful day. Several of you have told me you've got your beauty sleep in and it really shows on you tonight. And uh, we're glad you did. We had a good evening here around the church house. I uh, got to do a, a baptismal service. Somebody asked if I'd been washing off the, the portico out there. And uh, it wasn't that. We had a, had a sister wanting to be baptized. And uh, she was in a wheelchair. She could stand but has a hard time walking. And uh, so they brought her here about 3 o'clock this afternoon. We come in here in the church and had some time of fellowship, some time in the Word of God. And then we went outside and... Uh, transferred her from the wheelchair to another chair and we had a, a bucket of water there and some say, well you sprinkled. Well I wouldn't call it sprinkling. I believe she's pretty well saturated when that five gallon of water uh, got immersed over her but, uh, but just had a good time in the Lord. You know what? I love God. I love God's people. I love uh, seeing somebody baptized. I love Holy Communion. I believe in taking the sacraments that the Lord told us. He told us to go into all nations and preach the gospel. And baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And make disciples of men. And that's what we've come to do. That's our whole goal. Is to see people saved. Come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. See them baptized and born again believers. Baptism ain't going to get us to heaven. There he is. <laughs> you have a, uh, I believe they're looking at a page number there. <laughs> <laughs> You go into the creek a dry center, you'll come out a wet center. But if you go into the creek a dry saint of God, you'll come out rejoicing for the Spirit of the Lord that will rest upon you. And uh, we just want to love and appreciate them. But uh, Veronica, just remember her in your prayers. That God will be with her and God will help her and touch her. And uh, these ladies are trying to, trying to find a song. Gracie, she's upstairs, got a migraine headache this afternoon. So keep her in your prayers, it sounds like. Uh, Brother Stacy, I talked with him after service was over. You know, the CT scan come back good. And after the doctors got done looking at him, they decided it was just probably vertigo that was causing him his ailments. And uh, they gave him some medicine for that, sent him back home. And when I called him about... Uh, 1.30, so he was already back at home, so uh, rest in, so just keep him in your prayers and God in touch him, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight, God, and we thank you for your mercy, your grace, your love, God. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, God, to be in the house of God. And Father, I pray tonight, Father God, that this spirit of oppression, Father God, from hell, I bind it up in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray a hedge around this community, God. We pray a hedge, Father God, around this county and the surrounding areas, God. Lord, this evil spirit, Father God, we ask, Father God, that it be rebuked in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father God, that it would flee, Father God, from here. Lord, the families, Father, that have already been affected, I pray, God, that you would comfort them and touch them, minister unto them, Lord, like only you can. Show your grace and your love unto them. Father God, for all of the other requests tonight, Brother Seth, God, touch his body, help him to heal. Lord, Sister Gracie, tonight not feeling well, I pray, God, you touch my daughter tonight. God, minister healing, Father, unto her body. And Lord, Father God, I pray your anointing will be in this house, God, Lord, that you'll touch each and every every one of us. Anoint our sisters, Father God, as they sing, Father, and we worship you. Anoint the preaching of the Word of God, and Lord, we'll give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Just remain standing. we got a wonderful treat.
reading to the book of Romans. Romans chapter number 8 tonight. I'm studying on a set of scriptures. And the more I studied, the more God started sprinkling things into my spirit. And took me other directions with what I was studying. And uh, I'm going to do my very best to tie all that together if I can here tonight. Those that are able, stand on to the reading of the Word of God. Romans chapter number 8. I'll begin reading in verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestations of the Son of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Can you say amen right there? Amen. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And that on, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? What? Yeah, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray, for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for our, the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are, are the called according to His purpose. How many believe all things work together to the good for them that love the Lord and called according to His purpose? Heavenly Father, we love You tonight, God. And Lord, I thank You for the reading of the Word of God. I ask, Father God, now that You would anoint Your servant, God, to preach Your gospel. And Father God, anoint the people, Father, here to hear tonight and visit with us in a special way. And God will give You all glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Brother Jerry, I like it. When you wake up in the morning, is that the first word out of your mouth? You said no. So when you first wake up in the morning, what's the first thing out of your mouth, Brother Luke? Oh. That's what I was looking for. Oh. A groan. In the scripture we read, Paul said in the book of Romans, there were three things that groaneth. He said, all creation is groaning right now. The earth herself is groaning. Why is she groaning? She's groaning because of the sinful nature, the sin of humanity upon this planet. If I'm correct, I believe I read where there was another earthquake maybe in Haiti today or last night or sometime. And maybe 12 or so were dead. I believe that there was a hurricane and a tsunami in Indonesia with maybe over a thousand dead earlier in the week or last week. 
We know the devastation several years ago, I believe on Christmas Eve, when they had a huge tsunami and earthquake in Indonesia. This is the earth groaning. It's an old me. An old my. Why? Because we have sinned and turned our back against God. Had there never been sin, the earth would have never groaned. It would have been glory and honor unto the Lord. It would have been, praise ye the Lord, Brother Jeremy. But because of sin, many of us, when we wake up, we groan. Come on, your back's stiff. Your legs are hurting. You can think, have I got to get out of the bed today? And you know you've got to roll out. Now, Pearlie's sitting over there saying, I never groan. I never complain. He just gets up and goes to work. I'd probably say amen to that for Brother Pearlie. But others of us groan. Oh, Pastor, we're the children of God. We don't groan. The text we read, Paul's talking about the church. He said the church, them that are redeemed, them that have took their place in the first fruits, amen, the redeemed of the Lord groan. Pastor, are you telling us it's all right to groan? I guess I am. Because Paul said in the Scripture that we groan. But then he goes on to say that the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, groaneth for us. Make an intercession on our behalf. To that I can say, praise the Lord. He said not say that He was grieved on our behalf, but that He groans on our behalf. Now, if we're not very careful, we will grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And if we grieve the Spirit of God, we're in trouble. I don't ever want to grieve Him. But if He's groaning on my behalf, making intercession for me, I want Him to groan a whole lot unto the Father on my behalf and intercede for me. But all of these things are happening because of a spirit of infirmity. We look into the gospel according to Luke chapter number 13 and we find that Jesus is in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. I find it uh, relevant that this morning we was talking about the blind man receiving his healing and it was also on the Sabbath day and there the priest and him coming to him and said, why did you heal him on the Sabbath day? You can't be of God if you've done this good work on the Sabbath day. You study the healings of the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll find many times people were healed on the Sabbath. Remember the man with the withered hand? And God sat in the midst of him and he said, stretch it forth. And the man stretched forth his hand and he was made whole and they got mad because it was the Sabbath. I believe I can justify in the Word of God the best day of the week to get your healing is the Sabbath day when you're together with God's people in the house of God. It's a good day to get your healing. Any day is a good day to get your healing, but I just have to believe on the day that you're worshiping Him, God wants to show up in a special way and show out with you. So we see that the Lord is in the synagogue on a Sabbath day and it said there is a woman there who is bound together with a spirit of infirmity. A spirit of infirmity. A spirit of infirmity is something that has made her sick. It's something that has plagued her. We don't know exactly what it is other than it is an infirmity and it is a spirit. And it has her bound together. I was talking to a man this week. I saw him and 20 years ago I started working with this man and I worked over 10 years with him and he's retired now and he come by where I was working to see us and I said, how old are you, Lee? And he said, 82. I said, well, how long did you work for the company? And he said, I worked 43 years. He said, I have now been retired two years. So he worked with the paving company doing asphalt work till he was 80 year old. And he was still in good health. He was still out doing things and he'd come by to get a mess of speckle trout from one of the men that was working with me. 
And we got to talking about our former boss man, and he said, Philip, you wouldn't recognize him right now. I said, what do you mean? He said, he come up on a job where I was out here before I retired. And he said, he was bowed over. He said, he shriveled up. He said, sickness has come upon him, infirmities come upon him, and I like to not even have recognized him. When infirmity comes into you, it's going to change your posture. When infirmity comes upon you, it's going to change your posture. If your back hurts, you're going to be like this. If your head hurts, you're going to be like this. If your leg hurts, you're going to be like this. It's going to change your posture. This woman had a spirit of infirmity that had changed her posture that she was bowed over. Now, for 18 years, she had been in the synagogue. In this condition. For 18 years, Brother Harold, she had come to the church in this condition. And yet she changed not. Does people continually come into our house of God and never change? These people come into the house of God and they never change in doctrine. They never change in their lifestyle. That's a sad situation if they don't. And there's also people that come in in sickness. And if they don't change, we're doing something wrong. Come on. God put us here to heal the sick. He sent us to lay hands on the sick and to see them recover. I want to see change. Well, pastor, not everybody's going to get well. That's true. Not everybody's going to get well on this life. Sometimes people's got to die. If everybody got healed here, we would have no desire for heaven. Because this would be heaven on earth. Sometimes people are going to have to die. Sometimes sickness is going to be sickness unto death. But there's other times sickness is going to be as it was with the man that was blind. That the manifestation of God can be done in their life. That healing can take place and be a testimony. Amen. And I have to believe that much of the time that sickness is there for a testimony. Of what God can do. Now this woman's sickness. Was not cancer. It was not osteoporosis. That had her bowed together. It was the devil. Riding her back. Listen. The devil had put a saddle. Upon that woman. And had rode her. To the place. That she was bowed over. The very first time that I preached this message, there was a young man in the church named B.J. Parrish. B.J.'s been married now several years, and this past week he just had his second baby. He's a daddy times two. And when I preached that message, I had the wonderful idea that I was going to let B.J. be that evil spirit and get on my back, Brother Bill, while I preached. And I carried him on my back while I preached for 45 minutes. It went over wonderful in the church service. But Monday morning, I was groaning when it came time to get out of bed because every muscle in my back was sore and it was tight. But if we'll give the devil a place to ride, he will ride us to the place that he rides us right to the grave. He was taking that woman to the grave. Eighteen years she had been coming in the church and nobody had enough wisdom to know that that infirmity upon her was not sickness but nothing more than the devil and somebody needed enough boldness to stand up and say in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ flee from her and cast that demon out. Get it off of her. Depression, oppression will ride you to the place of the grave. You will find sickness in yourself that you don't even have if the spirit of infirmity is oppressing you. You will get to the place that you will literally make your body sick because your mind is sick by what the devil is whispering in your ear. Jesus come in and what did He say? He said, Woman, thou art loosed. 
I know that there's been preachers and television evangelists has took that and done great works with the great crusades. Woman, thou art loose, wrote books and everything else. But we need some men and women to be loosed of that spirit of infirmity. And God can set them free if they're willing. And I believe this woman was willing. I believe for 18 years she was desiring help. But help had never come. Well, this day help walked in. And his name was Jesus. He went and laid hands on her. And she was healed. And she stood up straight. You've heard me over and over tell the story of Brother Savage. Well, as soon as I see another man get healed like that, I'll have another story to tell. But he was six foot seven. He was a big man. And he come in that church that just had eight foot high ceilings. When he come to the chandelier, he had to duck to get his head under it. But on that Sunday morning, he was bowed over with arthritis. Could hardly walk. But when the power of God hit him, the walking stick went flying, his back went straight. He took off running down the center aisle of the church, praising and glorifying God. And I told you, I'll never forget his testimony, and you won't after I get done telling you so many times. He said, God is good, and this healing is better than ice cream. I said, that man loves ice cream. And him, 87 year old later, 18 years later, I asked him, Brother Savage, did the arthritis ever come back? He said, Brother Cocker, and I've never had a pain since that Sunday morning. That spirit of infirmity left him that day. God set him free. Soon as this woman's back straightened up and she began to glorify God, the ruler of the synagogue got mad. Got mad. You're healing her on the Sabbath day. I just couldn't imagine what was going through Jesus' mind. The Lord said, be angry and sin not. And we knew He didn't sin. We knew sometimes He got in the temple and got angry enough to turn the tables over. But God had to get upset with that ruler. For 18 years, she's been coming to you looking for help and you've offered her nothing. I come in one day, set her free. And you're mad about it. My goodness. I would the Lord Jesus Christ would walk in every service that I'm in and touch everybody. And we'll praise Him and glorify Him. And we not one of us to get mad. God, this is your house. You come and walk however you will. However you may. We want you to have liberty. Jesus went on to tell them that Satan hath had her bound. Bound. That spirit of suicide, that is a binding spirit from Satan. Nothing more. Nothing more. <clears throat> Over the last couple of weeks, I've heard several testify that they almost committed suicide or was thinking of suicide. It breaks my heart. I've seen the aftermath of it. I walked into the room where my cousin took a 16-gauge shotgun with a slug and put it to his head. I seen where the bullet went out the wall of the house. But I got in the midst of and I said, devil, get me hands. I got that hand and uncle that's got to come back in this house. They just lost their only son. And you're not going to take them. And I began to rebuke him, Brother Mark. And the Holy Ghost fell in that house. The Spirit of the Lord came down. And there was a good neighbor who was a good Methodist man. He was in there trying to clean it up. He didn't know whether to run or whether to stay. But one thing he knew, he knew the power of God had come in that house. 
And here there's a greater power there than the power that took my cousin into eternity. Saints of God, we got power to bind them spirits of infirmity. God give us authority over them. And if we don't exercise that authority, they will run rapid. But if we'll exercise it, Jesus exercised it that day, and that woman was loosed. She was freed from that spirit. Jesus now with that ruler and all that had went on, I wondered what was going through his mind. And I found it in the book of Jeremiah. I believe this is exactly what was going through God's mind. Open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter number 12. What type of prophet was Jeremiah called? The weeping prophet. I don't believe Jeremiah smiled too much, do you? I believe Jeremiah probably kept a handkerchief handy to wipe his tears all the time as he wept over Israel. Listen to what he said in verse number 1. Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee, yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Jeremiah is about to ask God a question. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Every born-again believer in Jesus Christ has went through a trial at some point, and if you haven't, you will. And you will ask God, God, why does the way of the wicked man seem to prosper? You'll find yourself there. Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? Well, the answer is simple. Sin is but for a season. And the pleasure of sin will be a pleasure for a season. But the wages of sin is death. And there's going to be pain. Jeremiah is asking God these questions. And look how God answers. I want you to go all the way to verse 10 in the middle of God's answer. He's talking about Israel. He's been talking about them losing their heritage. And Jeremiah said, Many pastors. Oh, no. Woe unto the preacher. Woe unto the pastor. Woe unto me right here tonight. Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it desolate, and being desolate, it mourneth unto me. The whole land is made desolate, because no man layeth it to heart. Wow. Wow. I just have to believe that when the Lord was in the synagogue and he had seen that woman bowed over with a spirit of infirmity for 18 years and yet no one had been able to loose her, no one had rebuked that spirit, no one had prayed for her, and when he showed up and when he did, the pastor of the church got mad. Why did you do it on the Sabbath? And he said, you have destroyed my vineyard. You have trodden my portion under foot. I try to be very careful what I say. When I first started dating Sister Cochran, before I ever even knew who she was or knew where she went to church, the Lord had laid on my heart to go back to the church of God. To go to the Franklin Church of God. It just so happened that a few weeks after that's when Melissa 
told me to call her. And 20 years later, come Wednesday night, here we'll be. But God had already been dealing with you in that church. It was during that time that my grandfather tragically died in a logging accident. When I was 19, and I held him as he took his last breath, I thought my world was crashing in. I didn't know what to do. There's no way to control my weeping. No way to control my mourning. But that man come and he knelt down by my bedside. And he prayed a prayer and he touched God. And I got a peace that day. And I'll thank him forever for that prayer he prayed. I can't tell you the words he prayed. I can't even tell you what he was wearing because I didn't look at him. But he come in me weeping on my bed. And he touched God. But I've heard pastors get in the pulpit and say, God's called me to tear down. Let me tell you something. God don't call pastors to tear down. God calls pastors to build. God calls pastors to build. He said, you have destroyed my vineyard. You have trodden it underfoot. I tell you why, there's a lot of groaning going on in 2018. Because there's been a lot of vineyards tore down. There's been a lot of vineyards destroyed, Brother Mark. say it. Pastor is not a career. Pastor is not something you can go to seminary and walk away with a degree and go and draw a salary and benefits and look toward retirement. If you're not called a God to be a pastor, woe unto you. And I'm talking to myself. Because if you go there, and God's not put you there, you'll destroy a vineyard. You'll trodden it underfoot. And all of creation will groan. The church, the first fruits of His Spirit, will groan. And the Holy Spirit will groan to make intercession. And when that takes place, that spirit of infirmity from Satan will enter into a congregation and to destroy it. I've been preaching maybe six months. I was young. I wanted nothing more than to preach the gospel. We went to the Scaly Mountain Church of God many nights to preach to a small handful of people. One time I got there on a Sunday morning. Prior to me going there preaching, we went there as a youth group and sung in the church house packed. People standing around the walls. But a pastor had come in there from Kentucky. There's just a handful left. And Sunday morning when I walked in, when I walked through the double doors, I stopped. It looked, it felt like I walked into a block wall. My wife stopped and she looked at me and said, Do you feel that? I said, I feel that. Roll 
Holy Spirit was there that morning. It was awful. Just going in the door, Jerry, he's like a hit a block wall. I walked in, I sat down on the front pew. I was praying to God, God, what is wrong? God, I've always had liberty here to preach. God, these people here are good people. I know them. They love you. What's wrong? A few minutes later, the pastor walked out from the office. I knew what was wrong. Sunday school ended and worship hour began. They sung some choir songs. They received an offering. He got up and he said, Come Wednesday, there'll be a U Haul in the driveway. I'm packing up everything I got. Me and my wife pulled out of here. I hope you people start shouting as we're going down the mountain. And in the spirit in which he said it was horrible. I felt that little widow women in that church began to weep and began to cry. And he looked and he said, Brother Cochran's here to bring the word. I didn't know what to do. I got up and I went to the pulpit and I laid my Bible down and I called out my text. He said, no, we're going to have a special song. Come back here and sit down by me. Oh, no. I went and sat down by him. He looked at me and whispered in my ear. He said, I hope you understand what's going on up here. And I said, I figured it out a while ago. They sung a special song when poor folks out there was crying. He went and sat down on the front pew. I hadn't been preaching but about six months. I was a novice. If I'd have been there today, I would ask him to, and his wife to go ahead and leave. Go ahead and go get the U-Haul and head down the mountain. That'd be fine. Because I didn't have no sheep left to preach to. He just killed them all. And that little church was heartbroken. Service come to an end. Brother Mark, it's been heartbroken hardly just about ever since church at once was running 50, 60, 100 people almost down to a handful because of one man. He destroyed a vineyard. He tried to mid underfoot and he's growing. When Jesus walked in there, he seen that the vineyard had been destroyed. Been trodden down. Now I don't know a whole lot about green vines. My grandpa used to have some. And come late summer, whenever them grapes started getting ripe, the raccoons would get at them. And we'd set traps to try to keep them from eating these grapes. But I know in order for him to have grapes, he spent a lot of time in that vineyard pruning on them vines. Cutting off them dead vines. I would look at them, I thought there's nothing left. But when spring come and things begin to turn green, they break forth. And I also watched how that when he had a young vine, it took several years. It took a long time for fruit to ever come back. And I understood when Paul Brooks told me, he said, Son, when a church gets hurt, when a church gets tore up, many times a generation has to die off before that church can ever come back. Why? Because the vineyard was destroyed. 
It was trodden underfoot. And the earth is groaning. The church is groaning. And the spirit is groaning. Listen. I got good news. I got good news. Let's read on in Jeremiah chapter 12. Israel here had lost their heritage. They had lost Jerusalem. They had been sent to Babylon. But look at verse 15. It shall come to pass. After that I have plucked them out. I will return. And have compassion on them. And will bring them again. Every man to his heritage. And every man to his land. What did he say? He said, though that pastors had come and destroyed my vineyard and trodden it underfoot, there'd be a day that they would return. The Lord would return. The people would return. And He would restore their heritage and their land. My God, Sister Diane, the church of God's got a heritage. We go down Highway 294, we find that heritage. I find that a generation ago, maybe two, we've been here 132 years. A couple of generations has went by. They've tried to stomp it out. They've tried to tear down the vineyard in Western North Carolina. But I just have to believe the Lord's about to walk through the temple again. Amen. I just have to believe <coughs> He's about to stroll back in. I just have to believe that that spirit of bondage that's been on the Pentecostal church, let me go a little deeper. That spirit of bondage that's been on the holiness movement and the holiness church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe it's about to get broken. And I believe that we can take what the words Jesus said when he said, Woman, thou art loosed. Are not we the bride of Christ? Amen. Is not the church referred to as the bride, the woman? Hey, saints of God, I believe we can say the bride is loosed. And I don't know about you, but I'm looking for a loosen. I'm looking for the Holy Ghost to bring a wave of revival right through this land. I'm looking for God to turn things upside down one more time. And I just believe before the of God sounds, God's going to do it. I got a good friend. He lives in Sarasota, Florida. He's a dear friend. His mom and dad, they grew up in the Amish and the Mennonite. His grandfather was the, the Amish bishop of all of North Carolina. North America at one time. They were powerful in the Amish church. But his father at a young age broke away from the Amish church. He was driving a truck delivering things. And one night in the middle of the night going down the highway there was a ball of fire in front of him. He was a driving toward it. He didn't know what was going on. It was a ball of fire. He didn't know if it was a wreck. He didn't know if it was the devil. He didn't know if it was the Lord. He didn't know what it was. But he said as he drove that ball of fire come right in the truck where he was it went right through him and he knew then I've got to get a hold of God I've got to pull this truck over I've got to find the Lord he made things right with God you know what happened God sanctified him filled him with the Holy Ghost give him a Holy Ghost filled life he raised a Holy Ghost family they would go to Haiti and minister to Haiti they'd go to the prisons and minister to the prisons
and they found favor to go back to Holmes County, Ohio and minister to the Amish children that were there and tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. That it wasn't of works lest any man should boast, but by the blood of Jesus Christ you can have eternal life. That man coming to me and he said, Brother, the Lord has shown me that in the last days He's not only going to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh like the Word said, I believe it's going to start right here in western North Carolina again. I feel it in my soul. I believe what God done way back then, God's going to do it again. We have a reason to believe, sisters. Brother Garrett said, He'll revisit the birthplace. Praise be to God. I believe He's about to revisit. I believe He's about to come back. And if we'll get ready, the Holy Ghost will move. We'll not be trodden down. We'll not be destroyed. There's some pruning got to go on. There's some vines that's got to be put in the ground. But if we'll prepare ourselves, we'll reap a harvest. But if you don't prepare, you will never reap a harvest. You know what I've done today? I took myself a little tour. I decided that I thought it would be a good idea for me to go in every room in this building today and see all the hard work that y'all have labored. And as I walked through them, God, fill them again. God, fill this room with little kids. Amen. God, let us hear the voice of the baby crying in the church house again. There ain't nothing to get me more upset than to be preaching in the house of God and you got a baby crying and you got half the congregation not looking at me, they're looking at the crying baby. Babies are going to cry. And they ain't no baby ever drowned me out preaching the Word of God. You let the babies cry, it'll be alright. Brother Mark, if we don't have babies in the house of God, the church is going to die. I don't want to see babies in God's house. Hey, Amen! I want to see the little ones in God's house. I want to see them singing in the choir. I want to see them worshiping around the altar of God. I had one little girl one time. Her daddy, her daddy had a, an ulcer on his leg. He was a Hispanic man. Grew up with a Catholic upbringing. He had went to doctor after doctor after doctor. And that thing could not be healed. It was like his flesh was going to rot off him. His wife was coming bringing her two or three little children. One Sunday morning that little girl, she decided she'd dance. I don't know if it was Texas two-step. I don't know if it was swing dance. But that little girl started dancing in the choir. She danced on the stage. She was down here dancing around the aisle. And I was waiting for my mom or somebody to come pick her up. Matter of fact, it didn't even cross my mind that she might be distracted. I might ought to go pick her up. And about the time I took one step toward her, the Holy Ghost of God pricked me. You leave her alone. She's worshiping me. My God, he said nobody else will dance for me in here. You leave that young and alone. And I let her dance her heart out. God, there's that baby's dancing in the spirit for three times he come at church. I opened up James chapter 5 and I sit down by him. And I said, can I read this scripture to you? And I told him, I said, the word of God says there's any sick among you. Let them call for the elders of the church. Anoint them with oil. Pray over them. The prayer of faith will save the sick. If he hath committed any sins, the Lord will forgive him. And I shared some testimonies how God had healed and I said, Brother, can I pray for you? He said, Yes. I laid hands on him. I didn't bring him to the front of the church. He was sitting like where Crystal was. I didn't call for the whole church to come get around him. I just simply sat down by him, opened up the word, read it to him, put my arm around him, and I prayed for him. 
tell you, God dried up that ulcer on that man's leg. Did he come back and give God glory? Nope. Matter of fact, about the time his wife was getting good in church, he pulled his wife and them little babies out and moved to Colorado and didn't tell nobody, even her parents, where they were going. Do you think I got like Jeremiah and said, God, why did you heal that man? To take that woman and them babies from the church house when there's people that be faithful unto you sitting on church pews every Sunday and don't receive their healing? You better believe I ask God why. Did God answer me? Nope. His ways are bigger than my ways. But I know He cleansed ten acres and only one returned to give Him glory. But there's one thing about it. Every time He washes that leg, He's got to know there's a God in heaven. And that God in heaven heals. Saints of God, ever run. Fill them. Fill them. Amen. You know what you've been doing? You've been making room. You've been working on the vineyard. You've been pruning the vine. You've been side dressing it. You've been getting rid of the dead wood. You're getting ready to reap. Thanks to God, I'm ready to reap, don't you? I'm ready for a harvest. Stand with me all over the house. Heavenly Father, there's a spirit of infirmity that's come against God's people. God's people are groaning unto you. Creation is groaning unto you. God, America is groaning in this hour we're living. And the only thing that will make a difference is an old time outpouring of the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. That will turn men's hearts back into the Lord. God let us walk in righteousness. God let us walk in holiness unto the Lord. And God let us see revival in the land. And let us bear fruit for your kingdom. God not only this church. Every church in this kingdom. Every church in this surrounding area. God, let us return unto the Word of God. And God, send us a harvest of souls. And Lord, will give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name. You're here tonight.